Welcome back to Eschatology Matters, and we have a special episode today, a round table. But before I introduce my co-hosts, I want to let you know that Eschatology Matters is now available on the Fight, Laugh, Feast network. So um, our content is still available through the normal uh, avenues. We are still on our, our same YouTube channel and our podcasting networks, but you can now also find us on Fight, Laugh, Feast. Um, so be sure to check out the, I think it's the Pub TV app, um, which our stuff will be available through as well through Fight, Laugh, Feast. I want to also encourage you, if you have not recently, check out eschatologymatters.org. Um, that's sort of our central hub. You can find most of our videos, our content, um, including some of our articles, and you can check out some membership tiers where you can have access to some uh, some special content through eschatologymatters.org. Uh, but I'm joined today with uh, my co-hosts, Tim Bashong and Jacob Tanner. So, uh, fellas, good to talk to you guys today. You too. Good to see you guys today. So we're doing a bit of a round table. We had this on the t- on the uh, on the docket for for quite some time. I know both of you are fighting off, uh, you know, illness, and so we're just going to all pretend we have raging fevers right now and see how the conversation takes us. Um, but one of the one of the first things I wanted to talk about, specifically with with post millennialism in mind, uh, with this conversation, with this round table, want to look at post millennialism. Um, we've been engaging with some recent videos um, from some uh, you know well known speakers, well known evangelical voices, um, and it is it is. Uh, re-emphasizing that there is still discussion to be had, there's still clarity uh, to be sussed out, and there's still some uh, some some dividing lines to be drawn. So, with postmillennialism, I wanted to uh, to ask this question: uh, While it's often adjacent to Christian nationalism, we'll just go ahead and jump in, in the deep water. Apparently, while it's often adjacent to Christian nationalism in many respects, um, there is more to postmillennialism uh, than Christian nationalism, specifically with its tenets um, and and the kind of worldview ethos that postmillennialism entails. So, walk us into that a little bit. Um, and I don't know which one of you guys wants to go first, but just as we conceive of postmillennialism, it is oftentimes lumped in with Christian nationalism. In fact, I've been I've been noticing a trend that post-mill, uh, Christian nationalism, and theonomy are all being kind of thrown in as as almost like synonymous terms, which is not at all accurate. But walk us into understanding how these things differ. Um, we know some people in the Christian nationalist camp we would agree with. We probably could pick out some voices that we would disagree with on certain things. But how does it differ from post-millennialism? Why is there this intersection, and, and what, what can we suss out there? You want to go first, Tim? Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Now nah, you go first. You go first. I got some thoughts here, but you go first. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think the the kerfluffle that took place a year ago, which would have been around April of 2023, demonstrated that there are a number of associations that people make when they think of post-millennialism or associations that they make when they think of Christian nationalism. And one of the uh, presuppositions from the people that seem to be opposing any kind of Christian nationalism. First of all, some of their Baptist arguments didn't make any sense to me at all. It seemed like there was a a boy crying wolf over, well, okay, so you're going to execute non-baptized babies or whatever. That was silly. Um, But a lot of their arguments were silly because they didn't address the real issues that were at hand, namely that blessed is any nation whose God is the Lord, full stop. And I think that w- what happened was that when when they saw the target on the back of, of all of us as saying, oh, I see, you're post-millennial. Therefore, in other, in other words, if you're going to be a Christian nationalist, you've got to subscribe to all these other things. And I think that's, that's just simply not being rhetorically magnanimous. I don't think if, if we have one or two writers that are uh positing certain things about their version of christian nationalism abc well then that necessarily means that everyone else is going where you've already arrived that is uh d e f um because sometimes people don't connect those same dots in the same way and of course post-millennialism looks to a future where the knowledge of the lord covers the waters uh, covers the land as the waters cover the sea, which is completely and all wet, you know. Um, and so I think their their commitment to premillennialism 
uh, got in the way of seeing the bigger picture. That is, man, your your own Baptist forefathers wouldn't have recognized the version of secular uh, naked public square that you seem to be pushing. Mm. So the the connection obviously is in a um, um, affirming Christ's lordship over all things. Again, full stop. That means the civil magistrate, um, the the no neutrality commitment. I think most of us have, where there's no, uh, it's either black or white in Adam in Christ for him or against him, and that nations are made up of individual people. So you can still deal with groups of people qua nations at the same time, recognizing that okay, not every single person in that group may be regenerate. Which is why I think the silliness over the is there such a thing as a Christian family came from, which that was just so dumb. Uh, but I, I know I'm going a, a far afield a little bit. I just don't I just don't think the the uh, selective memory of some of those guys when they would say, well, obviously Christian nationalism is always such and such. Well, that's not true. Yeah. And not every post millennialist is a Christian nationalist either. However, I think if you've got a view to the future like we would have, then a Christian nation isn't all that unrealistic. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. I was going to uh, add to it. I was looking for it and I couldn't find it. But one of the websites that I write for is The Art of Worship. And on The Art mm. of Worship, we've got multiple different guys, different theological persuasions. Uh, we're all reformed but just holding to different strands of eschatology, I guess. But what's really cool, and I couldn't find it while I was looking real quick, was uh, when I was joining the website to write for them, they asked me, you know, what's your eschatology? Um, which confession do you hold to? And then also, you know, do you hold to general equity, theonomy, stuff like that? And what well, I couldn't find it, but I know that it was on there last I looked. There were brothers on there who say that they're Amil and they hold to Christian nationalism. So this is not a distinctly post-millennial position. Um, in fact, I won't name him because he probably wouldn't want to be named, but I am aware of at least one uh, pre-mill brother who is also a Christian nationalist. He is fully on board. And it doesn't, I make fun of him because it doesn't exactly make sense from the pre-mill perspective as far as I'm concerned, but I appreciate him. He's a good brother. But the point is you don't have to hold to post-millennialism to be a Christian nationalist. And then like Tim was saying, there are differing strands of thought in, in what we're looking at with Christian nationalism. One of the other big issues that I see they try to bring up is they say, if you're a Christian nationalist, you must also be a kinist, uh, and therefore you hate the other races. And that is decidedly not true for the majority of guys that are pushing for Christian nationalism right now. In fact, I was recently invited to look over a document on Christian nationalism. It was actually penned by uh, Joel Webbin and a few other gentlemen as well. But there, there is sort of a hit back on that. And some guys are coming together and they're going through it and they're parsing it out and they want to highlight everything they disagree with. And I was looking at it and I was thinking to myself, what in this though, what in this document is really there to disagree with? What, what can a Christian look at here and say, nah, that ain't for me. Uh, in yeah. fact, and this might, I, I don't mean this in an insulting way, but as far as Christian nationalism is concerned, if anybody's able to find that document that Webin and the others penned, it's kind of timid as far as Christian nationalism is concerned. And I don't mean timid in like they're frightened or they're shying away. I mean, like, this is not at all what the the people who are fighting against it are saying is being presented. So I think what we're seeing and it's just like everything else, right? You have these guys building up straw men and then knocking the straw men down. And then everybody's over there high-fiving each other going, look, at what a great job we did. Meanwhile, the Christian nationalist guys are standing off to the side looking at the field of knocked over straw men going, what in the world are they doing over there? That's not even our position. And so I yeah. think we've got to be, we've got to define terms, but we've also got to be faithful to to stand for the truth of God's word and say, like Tim was saying, a Christian nation isn't actually a very strange thing to think about at all. In fact, if we have hope in the Great Commission, and we should, then what's going to happen? Nations will be discipled. That's right. Yeah. No, that's that's good. And I, you know, it's it's funny just just reflecting on us doing this this episode because I'm sure, 
you know, I'm sure Brandon will put some tags on there about Christian nationalism or whatever. Um, and I would assume that if people just look at the, you know, the thumbnail, they'll assume, oh, well, here's three Christian nationalists getting together to advocate for Christian nationalism. Um, Hurrah. And th- yeah. And that, well, that's part of the that's part of the reason why these these conversations, I feel like, are so necessary. Um, I think I've had to say this like three times recently, but I'm not Christian nationalist. I would not describe myself as Christian nationalist. Um, but like you just brought up. Um, Jacob, like when I read the statement on Christian nationalism, I, I don't find a whole lot to disagree with. And and I'm glad actually I'm I'm relieved to hear you say that some people are picking through it. Um, since Joel and uh, I think Dusty Devers was part of that statement and uh a couple other guys that, that I William should be thinking of. Yeah, yeah, yeah William Wolf, Jeff Wright, I think was part of that. Anyway, yeah. Um you read through the statement, you're just like, okay, like you can you can, you know, pick at the font or whatever you want to pick at, but like the statement itself, like I just don't see a whole lot that's radically um radically objectionable on there right um, I, yeah. I, I, I was thinking a few things but it, number one it it irks me that it's always combined with post-millennialism um you know one of the one of the premier books or at least one of the most uh uh one of the books that people like to argue with the most about christian nationalism mm-hmm. would be the case for christian nationalism right through canon press um and uh stephen wolf is you know famously not post mill he uh he has a lot of gripes with post mill and yet you know he's he's pulling for the book which the book again i read the book when it first came out i made sure to have it and i read through it and i find much to object to in that book i i disagree with a lot (laughs) in that book but i don't usually have the disagreements that i see online when i when i hear people railing against the book it's Mm -hmm. usually not the substantive arguments that he makes like not not to interrupt you but i think the reason for that is because they haven't actually read the book yeah well, yeah, and that's it. You know this. So, so all of us are in in, in writing spheres. It, it is it is endemic that people critique works they have not read, or they critique oh, yeah. authors that they have not read. Uh, you know, a sufficient amount of their work. It's it's that that's that's tragic. Um, but it's also Christian nationalism. When you think about that, it's 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 not just dealing with those who believe that the nations ought to bow before the king. That's not Christian nationalism, but that's oftentimes the way I hear it applied is that if you have any sort of conception of nations bowing to the king, that must be Christian nationalism. And that's just simply not true. Um, You know, like you guys were bringing up a minute ago, that's that's been the state of many Christians for most of, you know, Christendom has been looking at looking for nations to bow before the king. You think toward Revelation and it never ceases to amaze me that most people would take the passage of Revelation where it says the nations come around the throne. They bow before the king. Everyone agrees. Yes and amen. There's a thing called a nation and it bows before its king at some point but we're talking about the here and now um mm-hmm. in between there being nations in the old testament and there being nations in the eschaton what's happening now so um just believing that nations ought to bow before christ is not christian nationalism but it drives people into the at least i don't want to say drives them into the camp of christian nationalism i think people are are uh are oftentimes eager to ado- adopt the term Christian nationalist because they feel pinned in a corner with that sort of vitriol. So I just say, yeah. I think it is good for a nation to honor Christ as Lord. And then the pushback is, well, that sounds like Christian nationalism. And I think what I'm seeing is a lot of Christians just say, okay, like if that, right. I, 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 I did not think that's what this was, but if that's the term you want to ascribe to it, okay, that, that must be it. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, it's, that was kind of the tenor of the, uh, the founders conference, the one it was, I think it was like a year and a half ago, and they had the pre-conference on Christian nationalism, and I think it was, I think it was Vody Bauckham, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, beforehand that just kind of put out some biblical truths. It was like, if that's it, then that's me. But it was either him or Tom Askell that had said that. But um, I think that's the way a lot of people went with it. But it's also, and this will be my, the last thing I say on this, but it's the it's the pushback, kind of like you were talking about Jacob with the straw men. Um, so when, when you have a movement, especially one like Christian nationalism, and you're engaging various actors within this movement, you can try to you can try to thoughtfully dialogue with them um, like Andy Nacelli did, which if we mention this one more time on Eschatology Matters, we're going to start charging Andy Nacelli for <laughs> for references. But but that was good. Right. And it was helpful and it was thoughtful and it was and, you know, that Christ overall uh, taxonomy that he did. So that's good. But when people come out and just say, ah, you think nations should bow before Christ, therefore you must be a kinist or just an online troll. That, that that doesn't right. really help. Kenneths and trolls are out there, but I don't think they're in numbers that uh, that that a lot of people think they are. But any I, thoughts? Any closing thoughts on that? I couldn't agree more because what what's happening is what some people predicted about six months ago was trust me, if you think anything consistent with biblical Christianity, right. this is who you will be labeled. And mm-hmm. so at this point, you're right. People are saying, okay, fair enough. If that's if that's what uh, if you want to call me a Christian, okay, I'll wear it. You want to be call call me a follower of the way? All those were 
you know, pejorative terms, my right. goodness. <laughs> and it's like, it, all right, fair enough. Um, and, and by the way, this, that definitely is where, um, the uh, the big Eva mid Eva playing along with their secular overlords are, are saying that any consistent application of God's law in the public sphere automatically Christian nationalist and and you obviously uh, also must embrace the absolute most outlying worst tenets of this teeny little group over here in Kentucky somewhere I only know that because they do live in Kentucky. Um, who are espousing uh, things that you wouldn't believe at all. So it's like, you know what, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow you to drive the ship, you know, right. as, as our friends say, assume the center that this is where it's always been up until a hot second ago, no one would have thought anything about uh, it being scandalous that America was a Christian nation or should be. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could just add one more thing here, I think, that that whole divide between uh, secular and Christian really is one of our biggest challenges right now that we we really do need to fight against. That whole idea that there's a secular sphere is just absolutely awful because there there is no sphere over which Christ is not Lord. Right. And Amen. it used to be everybody agreed on that or for the most part, Christians agreed on that. I mean, our country was founded by Christians. Mm. Uh, and and what's amazing, I don't know if it was like this for you guys, um, but growing up, I was in the public school in New York, and I heard over and over again that our founding fathers were not Christians, that they were deists, that they were all of these different things. And now as I've grown up and done more research, I've come to find actually, yeah, there were some deists, but quite a few of them were Christians. And the principles of our Constitution are Christian in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 strange to me that we as Christians have bought into the lie of secularism and we've just sort of capitulated and said, sure, uh, you say that we're secularists. That must be exactly what we are. You want us to be neutral? Sure, we'll be neutral. And and it's this this crazy idea that Christians somehow have to play nice. Right. Or we're just cast out of the public sphere, public square, and nothing we do or say matters. So we just kind of go along with it. We let ourselves get pushed around so often. And this is a prime example of that. No, not every post-millennial is a Christian nationalist. Christian nationalists don't all agree on the same thing, but it is a pejorative term. Yeah. And in one sense, uh, we're going to have to embrace it to some extent. Uh, we're not going to be able to get away from it. If you are a conservative Christian who thinks that God's laws are good, well, you're a Christian nationalist then, according to some. And to some extent, I think we have to embrace the term and say, sure, I do believe that Christ is king. Uh, but then we have to define terms. Don't just let ourselves get pushed around. Right, right. Let me just add one thing. Um, you're both sitting in your library. Mine's in my living room. I'm in my studio. But I do have one book within reach I would highly recommend to anyone who wants to uh, really dig into the roots of the American founding, were the founders Christians or not, uh, all individually evangelical. It's this little book by Rush Dooney, This Independent Republic. You got to get this. I'm on my second time through about a month ago. Very good. And it just gives the lie to the whole idea that um, the First Amendment just kind of sprung up out of whole cloth out of nowhere you know poof hey look freedom of freedom from religion isn't that great yeah what a bunch of nonsense I, we're gonna get we're gonna get derailed a little bit because jacob i want to kind of push in on what you were saying because because this is I, I think for a lot of people well two things you brought up just the, the first one was you were talking about um the the, the crown rights of christ and all of creation um so we've engaged a little bit with uh, two kingdom theology. Um, we've mm -hmm. engaged a little bit with that that idea of a you know common kingdom versus a redemptive kingdom, or however you want to parse that, um, and gotten a lot of pushback. Probably more pushback on that than we have on the eschatology. Um, I say more pushback, at least you know maybe more heated pushback, or however you want to frame that. But um, I think one of the reasons why that sort of thinking, which is which is very popular in reform circles. Um, is so worth engaging and so objectionable from my perspective is when it begins to bifurcate Christ's rule in this world. So, mm -hmm. so if all of a sudden Christ 
does not currently have and exercise all authority in heaven and on earth. But in fact, there's this there's this you know realm out there that has different rules and a different kind of ruler for the time. That that's where you start to get this this conception of a, a of a sphere in which um, Christ's crown rights don't apply, like you like you were speaking about. I don't think they'd use the the term neutral, but it's it's definitely a different sort of kingdom with a different set of laws. That, that that's one of the reasons why we pushed in on that and 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 engaged with those perspectives, not because it's um, easy nor popular, but because I think it's important in our day and age. But also. With the Christian nationalist thing, I, I'm I'm still thinking through this, so I say this, you know, with all the with all the love and respect. I wonder, I wonder to what extent we uh, we adopt the label because it is being foisted upon us. Um, because because oftentimes when you hear that label, and again, I know this is this is a bit pejorative, but this is just me thinking through it out loud. Um, when you'll hear that label, it'll often be attached to other words that we definitely would not want to self ascribe to ourselves. So you're not just a Christian nationalist; you're a and you can already hear the adjectives, right, yeah. that are attached on the front end of that. Well, I'm not going to just jump in and say, like, I own it, right? Like, mm-hmm. th- that's not being thrust upon me. So I still think there's room for dialogue, and especially within oh, yeah. within the ca- within the camp, right? To the outside world, I know what I'm viewed as, and I, I'm not yeah. too bothered by that. But for us, right, for Christians, I think there's still there's still room for parsing that out and saying, eh, I'm not quite there with you. We're brothers. Mm-hmm. I'm on the same team. But, like, I'm seeing this a little differently. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that statement, too. And – um I mean, just thinking through in my head right now, uh, those sort of outside uh, the church forces that seem to come against us. Yeah, I wonder how much, and I haven't done much research on this, but I wonder how much that term Christian nationalist has increased in usage since uh, Trump's presidency and now how much we're going to see it again in this coming election year. You know, if you're a conservative voter, you must immediately be a Christian nationalist, too. And when they use the term, they mean something completely different, right? They're not, they don't have the theological associations that we do. So they're probably not, they probably don't even know what kinism is. They're just throwing the term out there like, hey, you follow Christ as your king, ha, ah, Christian nationalist. Right. And so I think we got to keep in mind that too, that sometimes when the term's used against us, uh, people mean completely different things by it. So we also got to be smart about that and realize who are we speaking with? Right. I think yeah. I think the thing that what you said a minute ago that that had a lot of value at the at the very beginning of of of, you know, this kind of dialogue was essentially when somebody pushes in from the outside that we not let them separate our own camps. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? So like if 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 we're linking arms and, and one of us has, you know, like there's three of us sitting here on this on this channel and we all three have just different nuances and our engagement of culture and society and politics. But then somebody else points in and says, ah, Tim looks like a Christian nationalist. I don't think that's the proper time for Christians to say, oh, he probably is and point the finger over at him because we're not the ones being targeted. I think that is the time where we stand up and say, no, 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 like you're not actually you're not actually having a problem with Christian nationalism. You're having a problem with Christianity. Now that's let's right. talk through those issues, but not let it not let it not let those those pressures from the outside divide those in our camp because we're so quick mm-hmm. to eat our own uh, on these issues, it seems. Yeah, that was that's what happened a year ago. Yeah, it seemed to me that this entire a uh, group of guys were determined to so far distance themselves from any connotation that they were willing to throw their brothers under the bus. And I, that was disgusting. Well, it's an election year, Tim. So buckle up. It's going to get dicey. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, let's talk about it. Let's talk about a cheery, non-controversial topic. Um, let's Ooh. talk about how you guys uh, mm-hmm. became convinced of post-millennialism and give a little, little personal testimony, but also a little theological reflection um, on what was it that led you individually into post-millennialism what would you find most convincing or compelling i'm curious yeah um i'll go first how about that you know growing up in the 60s and 70s in the uh, middle american evangelical church where your dispensationalism was a calling card for uh, conservative bible values by the way um there are Bible colleges and seminaries that required you to take a, a strong stand, sign a statement that you believed in the fill in all the blanks, pre-wrath, rapture, pre-tribulation, return of Christ, set up as earthly king. Because if you didn't, then you were suspect. And they thought, well, you must not believe the Bible because the Bible clearly teaches. In, you know, and so that was my environment growing up. I even... Uh, Believe it or not, I saw John R. Rice speak. Does anyone even know who that is? 
<laughs> I'm really dating myself now. Um, no, I'm with you. Yeah. So uh, fight and fundy, you know, sword of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of the take no prisoners, no compromise view of doctrine, which is very narrow. It's kind of a, a fundamentalist uh, in the bad sense of the term, IFB type of fundamental. That was my background. So, you know, when I, when I decided, okay, and in fact, I was talking with my mother yesterday, I'd take her to the dentist and we were talking about our, our uh, evangelical past in the seventies and our, my dad, especially how there were just certain things you just accepted as fact. This is how it is. And uh, any derivation from that would be seen as unorthodox. So when I, turn my life around god grabbed me and said repent or die and i'm so glad for that um when i was uh, 26 years old um i kind of i put all my music away for a while i just started reading the bible um still have a lot of baggage though from from uh, evangelical upbringing in that milieu milieu and so when you start reading outside the box a little again i'm a schaefer guy and then uh, somebody, I don't know why they introduced me to R.C. Sproul, and that just ruined everything, you know, what's wrong with you people? And as I began to examine my own assumptions about uh, the overall arc of the Bible, uh, that's when I began to think, okay, maybe, maybe I don't have to be such a, you know, dyed in the wool dispensationalist to be a conservative Christian. Well, it takes a while. It's like it's like turning the Queen Mary around, you know, your whole life going this one way and you, you take a break and be a rock star for a while. So it was it was probably during the mid 2000s that I started examining uh, seriously all millennialism. I was I was there for a while. I think a lot of that had to do with the uh, this age and the age to come paradigm. Um, that was taught by a number of the Reformed Baptist guys at the time. And um, it, was, it wasn't any big epiphany, and I don't think it was any one book, but it was being encouraged by some of the guys I'd met to look at the passages in the Bible that spoke of the kingdom and spoke of the rule of Christ and spoke of his, the nature of his rule, that it all kind of came together and so instead of being um, an optimistic Amel, I said, well, why not just drop all pretense? Um, let's embrace this. And then I started reading outside the box a little more too. Uh, guys like Ken Gentry, um, who's, the, who's the guy, uh, Gary DeMar, who's kind of recently gone a little wonky on some stuff. Um, Greg Bonson, very helpful. I read uh, RC's RC's book, uh, the Gospel, or no, the um, the, the last it, days according to the Jesus. last days according to Jesus. Um, that was probably the least helpful book that I read. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Keith Math uh, Matheson's book, Post Millennialism, but especially Victory in Jesus, that that just it seemed to cement everything in my mind as far as the as as you know, my good friend Josh continually says, a whole Bible eschatology, Genesis to Revelation. What's the goal? Where are we headed? And how are we getting there? And uh, that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. Hey, amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Uh, so my story, um, I guess, started really uh, a couple of years back. I was pastoring a church. I won't name names. But I was pastoring a church where the sort of bylaws required you to hold to dispensationalism. Uh, the the bylaws literally said if you don't hold to a uh, premillennial return of Christ and a pre wrath rapture of the church, you cannot preach in the pulpit of the church. Now the church also said in their bylaws that if you believed in once saved always saved, you couldn't preach in the pulpit either. So I mean, I had I had a lot of things going against me while I was there. Um, but I had been struggling for most of my teenager years trying to figure out what is the right eschatological view. And I was I wasn't really reading anything in particular. I wasn't really looking for what other people were saying. Um, probably my big wake up call when I was a teenager was my I guess you could call him my youth pastor at the time. He was leading us through the book of Revelation, you know, all of these teenage kids, and he's taken us through Revelation and I can't tell you, he was dispensational. I can't tell you the number of times 
that he would stop and say, now, this is a little strange and this doesn't make much sense because it seems like this already happened. But but, you know, this this is going to happen at this point. And then he got up to the beast coming out of the water and he was like, I think it's a literal beast. And then he got up to other parts and it was like by the end, all of us were confused and even he was confused and he was going, yeah, I don't know. That's just that's what we believe. That's our church. And I remember at the time I was probably 16 just thinking that can't possibly be the way that you're supposed to read Revelation. Uh, because it begins by saying, blessed are those who read this. But there was no blessing there. I was just utterly confused. So fast forward, I'm pastoring this church, assistant pastor, and they ask me to teach through the book of Revelation. Uh, so I was uh, an expository preacher, still am, but they had never heard preaching like that before. And so everybody was just excited and they were like, hey, we love Revelation. We know we're in the last days, right? Like it's clearly here. Rapture's going to hit at any moment. Why don't you teach through the book of Revelation for us? We would love that. Um, so I did. And as I was reading through it, I was becoming more and more convinced that dispensationalism clearly wasn't my view. I, I couldn't hold to premillennialism either, not, not in good conscience. And I didn't know enough about amillennialism and postmillennialism to say that there was even a difference. And one of uh, the fun things that happened was I was reading Joel Beakey's uh, commentary on Revelation, and I was reading Doug Wilson's commentary on Revelation. So this was maybe five, six years ago at this point. Oh, maybe longer than that. I'm not sure. It was a couple of years back. But I was reading both books, and I remember going, there's really not any difference here between the two of them. So I went to the pastor, and I said to him, I think I'm post-millennial. The pastor goes, okay. I said, do you want me to keep teaching? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I keep teaching through Revelation and I get more and more solidified that this is definitely the view that I'm taking, that this is this is the one that makes sense. This was already what I was kind of thinking. I just didn't have a name for it. I had never studied it in eschatology book. I was just studying scripture. And this is what made the most amount of sense. So we got up to Revelation six. Yeah, it was Revelation six. I was then asked, uh, Pastor Jake, when do you think the rapture hits in chapter six? And I said, I'm pretty sure the rapture doesn't hit in chapter six. In fact, I don't even think there's a secret rapture at all in the book of Revelation. And uh, two months later, I was out of the church. So wasn't necessarily a happy ending there. But um, you said happened... you didn't believe in a secret rapture. Yeah, you're yeah. fired. <clears throat> um, oh, man. So actually, and they'll probably never listen to this, so it's fine. Um, they actually stood up in the middle of my teaching. Uh, on a Wednesday night, you know, everybody's there. So I was literally teaching it. They stood up and they began to yell. My wife was there and they just began to yell. We can't let him preach here anymore. We need to fire him right now. He's demon possessed. So I was getting hit by everything. And great, I just great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Yep. Yep. And that, that was exactly it. I couldn't say anything to get them to sit down or to calm down. So I just ended it. And then I went to the back and tried talking to them and it was it was crazy the way that they were acting about it. Like they were they were ranting, raving, throwing their arms around, screaming. Uh, when I say screaming, I mean legitimately screaming that I had taught opposite of dispensationalism, that I that I dare think there's no rapture. And then they brought up the Calvinism stuff, too. And they were like, and we know you're a Calvinist. And then it was just I was done at that point. Um, and actually, I will say the church did not fire me. Um, I ended up stepping down because I was given an ultimatum and the ultimatum was, uh, you can stay here or, but if you stay here, you can't read from certain biblical texts anymore. Uh, so they like literally said, I can't read from Romans eight, Ephesians one, cause they both speak of election and predestination. I couldn't read from revelation anymore cause they disagreed with that. And in a really weird way, this actually solidified my position even more where I was like, if everybody is so upset about this. Postmillennialism has to have some truth to it. And if that's if that's what this term is, because I was already there, you know, like I had already believed a lot of the postmillennial tenets. I just didn't know what it was called because um, I was just reading the Bible at that point. I wasn't studying eschatology books, but I just embraced it at that point and said, you know what, if this is a make it or break it point for people, um, it's worth it. It's worth it, because if we love Jesus, we love the truth. And if this is the truth, I'm going to believe it and I'm going to proclaim it. So, yeah. That's my exciting little venture into uh, learning about postmillennialism. Wow. I, I was going to say, I mean, at least they weren't apathetic. 
because that's usually what <laughs> I rant against is apathy in the pew. But that's that's a step beyond. I'll tell you this though, um, I've I've never I've never had that experience. Well, not yet anyway. We're still young, right? <laughs> but um, the the first two times that I was called a heretic, both by a seminary professor. Um, the first time was over God's sovereignty and salvation. Um, I said, I think, I think God does what he wants to in all things. And he's, he thought that was heretical. And then the second thing was, I was like, I don't think this dispensational model that you're holding to, I don't, I don't see that. I don't, I don't, I don't think there's a secret rapture. And that was the second time. So, um, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's definitely a, yeah, it's, it's, it's heated waters. My, yeah. my journey, uh, in post-millennial thought because when when I met Tim Bashong, I probably would have uh, would have said, you know, I'm an amillennial, but not that kind of amillennial, you know, something along those lines. Um, and and for a while here on the channel, even I was just sort of broadly postmillennial. And I say broadly, I mean it as far as amillennial and postmillennial thought being both broadly, you know, postmillennial Christ returns post the millennium. Um, and didn't really want to get too definitional, uh, too definitional with it. But a lot of a lot of my journey has been kind of a bottom up reasoning. I mean, well, James White's described his kind of a top down, uh, you know, reasoning. So he kind of saw like the the overarching structure, the overarching worldview of postmillennialism, and said, okay, from there, I'm kind of reasoning down into the individual texts. Um, for better or for worse, mine was the opposite. So mine was more, I, I'm, I'm an exegete. I like to work through passages. I, you know, I, I like the language work. And it was through working through a lot of those passages that then when you step back and you've worked through them and you've done the, the hard work, especially with, um, well, in, in my case, especially with the binding of Satan, right, which I think is just that that's one of the key factors you have to grapple with. And when you work through those passages and you, you feel like concrete enough and like, OK, this is what it's getting at. Um, this is what it is saying, the real reality of things, the true truth of things. This is what is actually occurring. Then when I started to kind of kind of zoom out a little bit, it was like, well, then what's the implications then? You know, if Satan is truly bound, if Christ says he's plundering the strong man's house, if he says he's going to uh, do these things, it's going to spread like leaven through a, a loaf. Like, what's that going to or leaven through a lump? Uh, what's that going to look like? Um, that that to me was the most the most convincing uh, of this. It, it it definitely was not the book of Revelation. So it was interesting to me to hear you uh, teaching through the Revelation. I've heard that from a lot of guys. Like they'll mm -hmm. be teaching through Revelation. Um, mine was teaching through John. Uh, and, and hitting John twelve thirty one and him saying the ruler of this world is cast down and it was like well wait a minute what that seems key though what 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 does that mean and what does that entail if um, I could actually interject here sorry please, for yeah. interrupting yours I did forget um, I should have mentioned this it wasn't just Revelation I don't want anybody thinking that it was only Revelation um, I did a radio show at the same time when I was at that church. And because I liked working through passages as well, I was like, all of that discourse would be interesting to oh, do yeah. for the radio show. Uh, so all of that discourse with Revelation. And then at the same time, I was I think I can use the word obsessed. I was obsessed with Psalm 72. Like I just I loved Psalm 72. And it was really those three things, those three passages working together that convinced me of my view. So just so that no listener walks away going, wow, how did he get all that from Revelation? It wasn't just Revelation. It was those right. other passages, too. No, that that's helpful. I and, and that's one of the things I always tried to tell. Um, well, I mean, I guess anybody that would listen, not talk a lot, but you know, just just trying to encourage people to form to form an eschatology before you hit the revelation. Um, that's not to discount the revelation, but like we can all agree, the revelation is hard. There's a lot of challenges there, and I don't think it's absent the rest of Scripture. I, I don't think anybody would say that. So by the time you get to the revelation, you should be forming those thoughts. Um, to me, it was the Gospels. It was. I think we did a video on that one time. the The strongman passage to me was particularly just um, just powerful. But it was once you start to once you start to get into into the reading and you read guys like J. Marcellus Kick and, uh, and you know this this balanced partial preterist strong on Christ's victory approach and you're like mm -hmm. th that that's it whatever this guy is that's that's where I'm at um, you stretch back even though even though he's a little harder to work through BB Warfield um, is one that I just I feel like he's a, a long lost cousin I read BB Warfield so I've heard I've heard people try to claim him for amillennialism right but he's he's post mill he's just working from the same the same sort of framework and that's always been my approach I've got I've got a a strong kind of two age conception of scripture, which is typically associated more with Ah Mill. Um, I've got some questions about the dating of Revelation that I've been, you know that's an ongoing you know, you know kind of in house debate. So um, I've never been like the convenient post mill, but but uh, when you read like the BB Warfields, um, that's always just been like whatever that is. That's 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 what I'm seeing. Christ wins 
There, there's this yeah. overall structure we're both agreed on. He's coming after the millennium, and even though things look dark right now, I think he's going to crush this evil. I think he's going to keep reigning until he's done so over every ruler and authority and power. And whatever that looks like or however long it takes, I think he's going to do that in this world. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was kind of part of my journey. But any any thoughts on conv- being convinced of kind of a post-millennial framework before we move on? Can I quote Bonson now? Please. <laughs> All right. So this is from Victory <laughs> Always. Jesus. You don't have to ask permission for that yeah, one. Yeah, there we go. So this is, uh, if anybody wants to, you know, look up the quote, Victory in Jesus, this is page oh, 33. On. Hold that up again. Let me get, get you. Okay, there we go. Yep. Good. Okay. Victory in Jesus, uh, page 33. He says, we, this is the post-millennial view. We are in the millennium now. According to the post-millennial position, the millennium is a period of growth for the kingdom of God on earth, growth wherein the world will gradually be converted. And those who have died and gone to heaven, those who are martyrs, those who are saints will be vindicated. Though they have gone to be with the Lord, their labors will not have been in vain. Postmillennialists believe, therefore, that the kingdom of God will gradually grow on earth visibly, publicly, and externally. This will be obvious to everyone. We believe that those who die go to be with Christ and continue to reign with him even in heaven, and they will be vindicated, and their labors will not have been for nothing. We believe that at the end of this millennial period, Christ's return will synchronize with the general resurrection and the general judgment of all men at the very end of the church age. So at this point, Amils and Postmills seem identical. I'm putting seem in there. They believe that we are now in the millennial period as well. At the end of the millennial period, all men will be raised from the dead, general resurrection. All men will be judged, general judgment. There is no millennial gap after Jesus returns that separates his return from the final judgment. The final judgment is when he returns. So what separates then post-millennialism from amillennialism? I, I expl- so we're going through at our church right now a Bible study on post-millennialism. And the way that I've kind of explained it to our guys, very simplified way that I think has been helpful because amillennialism actually is post-millennialism, at least from the millennial perspective. So what actually separates them, especially when you have optimistic Amils who really do seem like post-millennial guys. So what's the actual difference? I've explained it this way. The guys have thought it was helpful. Uh, Hopefully I'm not making a straw man here. Um, I said that post-millennials are just trusting in God's promises from beginning to end. We're trusting God's promises of scripture that Jesus is ruling and reigning, not in the future, but now we are reigning with him now. And he is ruling until the whole earth is made a footstool beneath his feet. And that's going to happen. Uh, as we quoted already today, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. And Christ will be king. Christ is king. Christ is reigning. He is ruling. And he will continue to do so. And uh, would highly recommend, by the way, the book again. Check it out if you don't have it. It's great. It's great. Good, good quote on that. And and you heard how many times he referenced the kingdom because um, I've heard... I'm trying to think of the guy that that does it a lot. I probably shouldn't name him, even if I could remember. But kind of that the the optimistic pessimistic view, right? Like that's that's kind of been the trope. Um, ah, mills are pessimistic. Uh, Post mills are optimistic. Um, that that sometimes holds holds some weight, especially with some guys. That holds a lot of weight, right? Mm-hmm. But um, but like in general, I can understand somebody pushing back and saying that that kind of sounds hurtful or whatever. But what Bonzo was pushing in on was the kingdom, and I think that's key. Like like just Jacob, just like you were talking about, the, what is this kingdom? Is it heavenly only is it spiritual oh i did the did the thumbs up y'all see that that was beautiful this garbage yeah. update we'll edit that not really um anyway so when you look <laughs> at the kingdom there forever yeah when you look at the kingdom you know where is this kingdom is it spiritual alone is it heavenly alone or does it actually touch down and i think that's the huge challenge for people is Old Testament prophecies certainly seem to touch down. The way I'm reading the New Testament, th- those things touch down as well. That's not to say that the kingdom is just earthly, like we can just manufacture it out of wood and clay, but it, it means that it actually has an impact in this world. And that's that's always been to me where the dividing line was with with the Amel post mail discussions. Is where is this kingdom and what does that look like? Which is obviously a big discussion, but it's right up the alley of what you're saying. You want to hear something else really interesting from the book real quick? Yeah, just because we we looked at this last night and we we loved it. Uh, So this is back on page 24 in the book. And he's explaining before you get to Revelation 20, which is obviously where we read about the millennium. um, We have to go back to Revelation 19. And he says, John has been granted a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a victorious rider on a white horse riding through history with a sword proceeding from his mouth by which he may conquer all opposition so that the gospel is seen as defeating every enemy. So that's us uh, going forth 
proclaiming the gospel. That's the imagery of Revelation 19, uh, Jesus with the sword in his mouth. That's us proclaiming the gospel. Now, because of this, there is a great supper that is celebrated. That supper refers to the celebration that God's people enjoy each week in the Lord's Supper. Um, so there's also this great idea, I think, of celebration that postmillennialism offers to the church, where we can say, no, because we're reigning with Christ now and we're victorious now, um, that, that future marriage supper of the Lamb, which when I was growing up, I always heard was future. No, that's now. Um, we can have that now. And in fact, not just now, but that will stretch out, I believe, into eternity. That's something we're always going to be able to enjoy because of the post-millennial hope. So just something else that I think is very exciting about it. No, well, very cool. well, Jacob, to uh, to quote the, the great uh, William F. Buckley, I believe you're uh, over immunitizing the eschaton, but OK, I'm with you. <laughs> no, I had, I had a quote from from Bonson, just in case anyone gets the wrong idea that we're uh, we're just kind of happy go lucky and and uh, doing our thing. This is what, from his list: ten things that post millennialists believe. He goes, uh, uh, "We are in a battle. We're in a worldly battle. By that he means in this world until the Lord returns and sets everything right. What we deny is that we're on the losing side of the battle." And he goes on to explain how the U.S. won World War II, not by ourselves, but we were on the winning side. It doesn't mean that did anyone think that no one from the U.S. ever suffered or that we didn't lose soldiers or nobody had a hard time. Of course not. Our soldiers suffered. The German soldiers suffered and others as well. If anyone who goes to war is going to suffer, this is it is a battle. But that does not mean that both sides lose. One right. suffering side prevails, and the other suffering side does not. So as post-millennialists, I'm quoting still, we're not denying the suffering. We're denying that we're going to lose. We're denying that we're on the wrong side of history. We affirm and we are aware in our own lives very painfully that if you belong to the Lord Jesus, you will undergo persecution. You will be afflicted in this world. So we're not whistling in the dark or engaging in some kind of Pollyanna wishful thinking, thinking that is not post-millennialism. Yeah, and and yeah. that's worth that's worth pointing out. And if anybody thinks we're just kind of covering the same ground, um, like we said at the beginning, this is still quite frequently lobbied against post-millennials. So it's well worth it's well worth defending. Um, let's get into a little <laughs> bit of the specifics, at least. Um, I know one of the one of the topics we wanted to talk about because there's objections to postmillennialism. Uh, we've got we've got plans to cover a few of these in more uh, more exegetical depth. But one of the typical ones is that uh, that postmillennialism looks for more to be saved toward the end. Um, and we can talk about a great apostasy or a final rebellion or however you want to frame that. But in general, that things are going to trend toward more and more uh, bowing the knee to Christ, not less and less. That the church will actually experience. Uh, tangible, observable victory in this world and not become a smaller and smaller, seemingly defeated minority. Um, and, and the objections often come that like scripture does not scripture speak about a broad and a narrow way, um, that, that, that the way to life is narrow, but the way to destruction is broad. Doesn't, um, doesn't scripture speak of a narrow door through which one must walk? Doesn't scripture speak of many are called, but few are chosen? Uh, what are your thoughts on on some of those objections? Because obviously that's a couple of different okay. passages, but maybe we can engage one or or walk through it a little bit. But how how do you how do you grapple with that? If you're saying no, in fact, we fully expect maybe not in our lifetime, but toward the end, that more and more will actually become in Christ. Yeah, I think I think for one thing, um, that's that selective uh, passage from the Gospels. Um, yeah, Jesus is absolutely right. There's only one way to eternal life, and that's through him. He's the gate. Uh, the, all, all his sheep go through there. However, when you look at the, the promises of God going all the way back to Genesis uh, 12 and 15, and what God told Abraham that his descendants were going to look like, it wasn't this small, minuscule number. It's uh, stars in the heavens and sands on the seashores. He even says, if you can count them, good luck with that. You have no idea the amount of descendants you're going to have. And according to the New Testament, those descendants are those who have faith in Christ. So that that is where we start with. Now, was Jesus talking about um, an eternal situation throughout the entire church age? I don't believe so. 
And in fact, um, I'd done a little reading in this earlier today. And, you know, the context in Matthew 7 really is about treating people like you wouldn't be treated. The law and the prophets enter through the narrow gate. The gate is wide. The way is broad, leads to destruction. So there, there is a, there, there's a contextual uh, reading of the narrow, broad gate that has to do with obeying God's law and being a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. And the other thing is that if, if that's the case in, in the first century where Jesus looks around and says, hey, look, disciples, you know, we're, we're, we're in the church shrinkage business now, John 6. I tell you uh, over and over again, this is why you have to be given to me by the Father. You have to be drawn by the Father. By the end of that whole sermon series, everyone's gone except for the 12, and they're they're a little confused, and Peter, that's where Peter finds, well, where are we going to go? You have the very words of life. And so I don't think it's a matter of taking that uh, section or wherever uh, Jesus talks about the narrow way. Um, it's, an, it's a narrow way to full discipleship, but according to the promises already made, there are a whole bunch that end up on that narrow way. So I don't I don't see that as being uh, antithetical to the post millennial hope of uh, of um, a massive huge amount of uh, converted followers of Christ on the day of judgment. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, Jacob, what do you think? I, I would uh, second everything that Tim said, and in fact, uh, I was asked some of these very same verses recently in regards to post millennialism, and one of the things that I did is I, I took out the Bible and we worked through the passages together. And I pointed out that much of what Jesus was saying had a context. And that context was to the Jews at that particular point in time. And right. so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily follow throughout all of the ages. And then, like Tim said, I don't know how you can read Genesis, the promise to Abraham and see, you know, you're going to have innumerable descendants, right? As numerous as the stars, try to count them. And then you go to the New Testament, Galatians uh, 3, right? It's the end of the chapter, Galatians. I think it's Galatians 3 at the end of the chapter. All who belong to Christ are now the offspring, the heirs of Abraham. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you start thinking, well, even Revelation uses this imagery of an innumerable number of saints gathered around the throne, worshiping and praising Jesus. Um, that that great number just continues throughout the entire story of Scripture, and so it's one of those things where I think we often try to either proof text or we try to disprove theological positions with just one Bible text taken out of context. But we've got to be very careful not to do that and to faithfully handle the word of God. Yeah. Amen. Yep. Yeah. So echoing what you guys said, and I'm trying to think of anything, anything, uh, any gaps to fill in there. So when you look to... um when you look to, for example, the, the passages that speak of, you know, narrow is the road and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road that leads to life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Um, and then you look within that exact same, you know, immediate context and it speaks of many will come and they will come from the east and from the west and they will all gather in. Um, the question you have to ask, just building on what you guys said, is it's it's the context and it's also what is the clearest context speaking to the question that I'm bringing to the text? So my question to the text is, <laughs> yeah. you know, if you're reading through the Bible, it's like, it's okay, what, what context am I in? But if your question is, what is the kingdom growth going to look like throughout uh, this time until Christ's coming? Well, I don't think that's the focus of that passage. Like that, that 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 referent is not in view. That Christ doesn't sit them down and say, "Hey, let me walk you through exactly what what the entirety of the uh, the church age or the church experience will look like." But then when you do go to those passages, those seem quite clear about. Let me let me tell you what the kingdom is like. Uh, the kingdom is like a seed, and it grows into a tree. You you know all these, right? Like so, mm-hmm. so it's strange to me that we so often abandon what is clearly speaking about the eschatological growth of the kingdom and what that will look like prior to yeah. Christ's coming. Those are clear and they're they're pointed to why we abandon those for a less clear passage, which is at best not clearly referring to that growth, but instead has an, a, an immediate referent. And the best you can say is, well, it kind of tangentially relates to this other thing. Um, that's just very, that's very puzzling, especially when you come to the, the kingdom growth passages. I find, I think, I think that every, especially within eschatology, we all have Certain passages we sort of skip past, right? So every every view, every perspective has those certain passages they really love. They feel like they speak to it. Um, it's strange to me 
that you hear post-millennialism far and away beyond any other perspective speak about the kingdom passages. This is what the kingdom will look like, we're being told. And those seem the most readily dismissed by most other eschatologies. Um, I I find that very uh, puzzling and unfortunate, I suppose. Well, you remember that the very first time we met, and that was the, the conference in 2022, and I quoted Dwight D. Pentecost and his interpretation of the mustard seed and the leaven in the lump. And I, I, I forget, I, 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 tried to, I tried to express my utter disdain for his interpretation. I still can't do it strong enough because I'm like, oh, oh, so this is the gross outward appearance of growth in the institution. Oh, my stars. Boy, yeah. oh boy, what a stretch. What a stretch. Wait, do you have the actual quote? I feel like I need to hear this. Um, I I do. Um, yeah, talk about something and I'll, I'll find it because I know where it is. <laughs> I was wondering if you just have it saved, like if you need to feel angry suddenly. It's, it's his background on his yeah. computer monitor. He just stares just, at it. Yeah. He's <laughs> angry all day. Uh, he's like the Hulk. That's his secret. He's always That's angry. His, he's always angry. <laughs> Um, let, let's get into at least one. We had, we had one on here. I don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to get to this about, uh, eschatological universalism. I feel like that's a tricky enough topic that we might need to devote a little more time to that. That's B.B. Warfield It's coming from a quote that I used last week. I find that really, a really compelling way of addressing something using some, some probably confusing language, but, um, let's, let's at least look to this one. Uh, the future of ethnic Jews and Israel. Um, and I think this is a, a good question because uh, typically you'll hear, well, just in general, you know, D- Tim was talking about some of his journey. Um, many of many of the people that follow this channel have come out of dispensationalism or, or at least a default, you know, sort of popular level dispensationalism. Um, and usually the uh, the pushback against really any covenantal eschatology, but, you know, amillennial, postmillennial, um, is that there is no place for future ethnic Israel. Um, I've, I've, I've seen many. Uh, many authors within amillennialism and postmillennialism, it's seemingly doing overtime work to assure people otherwise. Uh, but that's that's generally the the misconception is that nobody in these camps, if you're not dispensational, you have, or maybe even historic pre mill, um, you don't have any sort of place for uh, for ethnic or national Israel. Now within our camps, there's a lot of variants, um, a lot of different answers. But within postmillennialism specifically, um, what what sort of what sort of future for ethnic Israel? Is there a future for ethnic Israel? Is there a place for the Jews in God's program and his redemptive design in the future, at least? What, what does that look like? And specifically from a post-mill perspective, um, how can we kind of address that question? So we're at our church right now also working on Sunday school through the Book of Romans. And we just hit on uh, Romans 9, 10, and 11. And what's fascinating about that text Uh, You were saying about covenant theology um, sort of being attacked by the dispensational view. Uh, Usually, pejoratively, it's called replacement theology, right? That we (laughs) replace Israel with the church and we have no place for Israel anymore. That's not the case. Um, Actually, and we see this in Romans 9, 10, and 11, we see that there is a true Israel of God. And Paul even explicitly states that not all of those who are of Israel are actually of Israel. Or in other words, just because you're an ethnic Jew does not mean you're part of the true Israel of God. So what is the true Israel of God? The short answer would be it's Jesus Christ himself, the kingdom of Christ, um, whichever way you want to look at it. When you get saved, you're grafted into this kingdom, the kingdom of God, um, Christ's body, the true Israel. Now, are ethnic Jews included in the kingdom? The answer is yes, so long as they repent and trust in Jesus. So they're not excluded. They're actually also called upon to repent of their sins and to trust in Jesus as their Lord and Messiah. And here is the amazing part about it. When they believe and when we as Gentiles believe, there's no longer a distinction, ethnically speaking. It's not that they're still the special people of God and we're somehow less special. It's that we are part of the same body grafted into the same vine, which is Christ himself, the true Israel of God. Now, Romans uh, 10 and 11, Paul seems to be making a very particular distinction where he says, now, these are still my people. Ethnically speaking, the Jews are still my people. I love them. 
Uh, Paul even goes so far as to say, I would willingly be a curse. I would be cast into hell if it meant that they would be saved. But you know what? I've been given this ministry to the Gentiles, and perhaps I can provoke the Jews to jealousy through your faith. And then he goes on to say, now, if their exclusion, if they're being cast out, if their rejection of Jesus meant the inclusion of the Gentiles that we are grafted in, he says, how much more will their, basically their repentance and their coming to Christ mean? And so I think that there are quite a few post-millennialists that actually do believe in the final analysis uh, in the end that there will be a revival of ethnic Jews who will be added into the kingdom of God. I know at least one post-millennial uh, friend of mine who completely disagrees with that, and he says, no, that's not what that language means. But either way, all would still agree what a Jew, an ethnic Jew must do is repent of their sins and trust in Jesus. There is not a separate gospel for them. Uh, there, there's not a different way for them to be saved. We are saved the same way through repentance and faith in Christ. Thank you for the thumbs up. I don't, I don't know what it's doing. I was sitting here playing with the preferences. I turned it off. I, it's possessed. Anyway, good, <laughs> great answer ruined by an unfortunate thumbs up there, Jacob. No, I appreciate that. Tim, Tim, what are your thoughts? Let's go with the thumbs up. Um, yeah, I just literally this last Lord's Day finished my series on the book of Romans. 88 parts, uh, 88 sermons, 88 reasons why the book of Romans matters. We'll publish a book later. <laughs> and w when we when we were dealing with those those texts, especially in, in chapters 10 and 11, um, you know, that was one of the one of the early post-millennial books, if you want to call it that, was The Puritan Hope by Ian Murray. By the way, read Ian Murray on just about anything. Oh, my goodness, what a Amen. wonderful author. And um, and so I, I grabbed a, a section of the text of my manuscript and um, looking forward to the day that there will be a great revival among ethnic Jews. I, I've, I've heard guys try to parse out, especially in chapter 11, that he... Paul there is only speaking to those who are of the faith of Abraham, that is, uh, Christians, period. I'm like, no, as you said, uh, Jacob, in, in the beginning of chapter 9, he's he's speaking uh, about his kinsmen according mm -hmm. to the flesh. This is his, his these are his people. And, uh, boy, nothing wrong with loving your people, you know. And so, oh, we're getting in trouble there. Uh <laughs> Yeah, so um, the video just got flagged. There you go. Yeah, just got flagged. Right. I, I, you know, whenever I'm around my kids, I always say, "Well, you realize you're my favorite people in the world. I'd rather be with you than anyone." You know, and I got kicked out of the room. Uh, boy. That sounds like that blim blam there, brother. <laughs> that's it. That's it. And and so so I still think there's there's obviously he's making the distinction between uh, the old covenant people and the Gentiles that have come into the church. Like you said, they're grafted into something. Um, and it, and those three chapters there in Romans 9, 10, and 11, you know, Paul's answering that the interlocutor who says, hey, Paul, if this gospel's so great, why so few Jews have come in so far? And he goes, nope, you, you missed it already. It's always been God's prerogative and election, period. And then by the time he gets to 11, he's looking forward, I believe, to an actual future ingathering of a whole bunch of ethnic Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's a, I mean, and that's a good, obviously you could probably, we could probably wade through a couple dozen, you know, post-millennial authors or, yeah. uh, or amillennial yeah. for that matter, but post-millennial and, and find a wide variance. It seems, it seems like there's a little bit of a, uh, maybe a generational uh, component to this. Uh, you know, you look at the reformers, many of the reformers would have agreed with Calvin, for example, and, and seen Israel in that passage as a spiritual Israel. So Israel is referring to the elect. Um, Tim, you brought up, I think, which is a solid point when you look at that kind of section of Romans 9 through 11, uh, the Romans 9, he seems to be speaking of of uh, ethnic kinsmen. It's it's interesting that I, I think what's important uh, for anybody, well, n number one, the answer to the question is obviously, I think you can find a variance of both views within postmillennialism, right? You can find those who yeah. see a future ingathering of ethnic uh, Jewish people. Um, and, and you see those who don't see any requirement for such and see the fulfillment done spiritually through God's 
three guys redemptive plan. And I think both of those have a fit. Um, I, th- I think the important thing is to grapple with why Israel was a nation in the first place. So what made Israel Israel in the Old Testament? And I think I think if you work through that honestly and biblically as best you can, um, the conclusion, it matters, the conclusion, but it really matters how you get there. Um, because when you, when you look to God's salvation of a people in the Old Testament, um, he calls a people to himself. You know it's not just ethnic. It's not as if God, you know, looks at your passport and says, "Ah, you were of Israel, therefore you get to you get to come and play." Um, instead, there's a genealogical principle, right? There is the promises to you and to your children after you. This is you know Genesis 17 onward. Um, some people see that that genealogical principle continuing in the New Testament. Some don't. This is where we get a lot of our in-house discussions with uh, with Reformed theology. Um, but in general, that's what made them a people in the Old Testament. There was a promise and is extended covenantally. To the children of believing parents, um, like you know, Jacob pointed out in, in Romans chapter four and and onward, there's there's it's all it's it's spattered all throughout the book of Romans that true Israel was uh, or that ethnic Israel was never true Israel. There was always those who believed in the promise, those who were resting in the promises of of God. Um, that was always the true nation. It was never your passport. It was never your right. ethnicity. Um, I find it troubling all that, you know, kind of to say, I find it troubling when, cause I said, it matters how you get to your conclusion. I find it really troublesome, whatever your conclusion is, whether you see a future in gathering or you don't, um, that you get there thinking that those Jewish people are special unto God based on their, I don't want to say ethnicity cause that term is so, so complicated these days, but the, like their genetics, right? Like Genealogy. that they have, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. That that because their parents were of such devoid of covenant, right? If it's a covenantal argument you're making, that's fine. If you're making that covenantal argument with unbelieving Jewish people, we've got a whole nother set of issues. But if yeah. you're just looking at a people and saying, oh, they were born into this this uh, group of people, therefore, that that's something to work through, I think, covenantally with the Old Testament. What was the function of covenant in actually being the formative uh, the formative device that God uses to mold a people unto himself and to count them as his people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. That was Y'all are lot. on the same page. With, I, I'm, I'm preaching to the <laughs> choir on that one, but yeah, yeah, that's I've, I've always, I've always tended toward uh, Calvin's view on Romans 11, but I hold it gently. And I think that's, I think it's probably proper. Um, yeah. I just, I, I, I think there's some dangers if you look toward, ethnicity as a qualifying factor before God. I think that always that always makes me a bit nervous when we look about that. And I, I know that's not exactly what those those who would hold to a future in gathering are exactly saying, but um right. It's definitely and th- this is why I keep uh I keep pressing back against those who are, you know, back to our very first question about Christian nationalism. I keep saying this is all about the gospel of Christ. You've you've used your precious liberty to break God's law, you hate God, and until you repent and turn to him in saving faith, you're not going to get any of this. You know, first, uh, second Timothy is you repent so you can come to a knowledge of the truth. And, um, the, you know, again, growing up in a dispensationalist household, you definitely got the, the vibe that, that God had a different salvific plan for, for ethnic Israel. And that was one of the things I just rejected whole heartedly i'm like there that can't be that would that would be uh dragging christ through the mud yet again you know uh uh-uh. one that's that's I, one I, thing I, no go ahead jacob sorry so if i could interrupt just for a second that actually is another thing that happened to me uh once i embraced <laughs> post-millennialism publicly um i had an elderly gentleman come over to me after a church service i was visiting this church and preaching and he took his finger and just started poking me over and over again after I was done. He said, you listen to me now, young man. You got the gospel all wrong. And I was like, what What do you mean I got the gospel? All? Like, that's a, that's a pretty concerning thing to hear, you know? Yeah. And he goes, uh, there's two gospels, one for the Jew, one for the Gentile. And you gave us the Jewish gospel today. And I was like, what are you even talking about? And he had this... Uh, I, I did some research then. That would be hyper dispensationalism, I guess. Yeah. And it's it's a whole thing. And they're not I don't even think they entirely know what the two different gospels are that they <laughs> seem to think exist. Yeah. Uh, Cause from after I researched what he was talking about, what he had said didn't even make sense. But clearly that's where he had gotten it from. So yeah, that's something I think that we still need to to sort of reconcile in people's minds that there's not two gospels. Uh, there's right. not two different peoples of God, one people of God, 
united by the common faith that we have in Christ. You know, one baptism of the Spirit. We're united by one Holy Spirit. It's not multiple Holy, one, one, over and over again. That's the distinction being made. We're one in Christ. Yeah, Jacob, and, and I've, I'd heard that, and, and honestly, in defense of my Orthodox dispensational friends, I know they don't believe that, mm -hmm. but... I don't I don't know how you arrive at a different position with the earthly people and the heavenly people and right I mean that was that was Margaret McDonald that's that was her vision back in the early Well and 19th it is it century. is it is consistent with a lot of modern it's not modern dispensationalism because it's a retrieval of classical dispensationalism but a lot of their argument would be um, that the Old Testament promises are made to the Jewish people. Those are not yeah, made to the church. Right. So when you read yeah. you know, any of the promises, I, you know, I referenced Genesis 17, that has no bearing on me because I'm a Christian, they would say, and I'm, I'm engrafted <laughs> in after that. That promise was not made to me. Whereas what we're maintaining is more of a, a Christocentric eschatology, that all the promises of God find their yes and amen in Christ, um, that, that yeah. all of Scripture uh, speaks to the glory of Christ, that all God's people throughout time have been saved by Christ and for Christ, whether looking to his coming or looking back on it. Like, it's it's Christocentric, but I, th yeah. I think, the, I think the, the common denominator of this whole episode has been, I've had a really boring church experience compared to Jacob. I mean, this is just, <laughs> what are y'all doing out in Pennsylvania, brother? Like, this is, I'm bored over here, apparently. <laughs> People just don't like me stuff. over here, I guess. Wow. <laughs> I would, hey. man, I, I would, I would give folding money to have video footage of that old guy. Let me tell you something, young man. <laughs> you paid retail for that. I could have got it uh -huh. for you wholesale. It'd make a powerful <laughs> gift, that's for sure. I mean, uh, fellas, he, had a, we've been... he had like a bony finger too. It, it hurt the way yeah. he kept on poking yeah. me. He didn't let up. It just kept going. Not even a plump, soft finger. No, no, no. It was, but hey. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. At the Amen. hand of an angry old hyper-dispensationalist man. Amen. What happens? Sure. No, guys, we probably need to wrap it up for the day, but um, I'm, I'm grateful for the discussion. Any any closing thoughts or any uh, wrap a bow on it um, for the end of the conversation? We didn't hit everything. That's okay. We'll save those for the next one. I think this is intended to be like the first of a few roundtable discussions, and we want to keep them manageable. But any closing thoughts or, or takeaways? Um, I, I, I'm just uh, – I appreciate – uh your ability to to argue with guys without losing your temper i mean i've i've seen that a couple times josh and uh the more i hear jacob talk the more i realize i should have gone to seminary you know that would have helped but mm. um anyway it is what it is i i think that uh um in in general if you uh end up taking again a whole bible eschatology and you you try to again uh as in my conversation with james white we were talking about these meta narratives these big themes in the bible and uh and and let those drive the details rather than the other way it's kind of like inductive deductive that kind of reasoning um you're you're going to end up with a victorious jesus and that again that's one of the things john cooper said drove him as a very young man to post-millennialism was the victorious nature of the person and work of our lord jesus christ right good Jacob. Hey, no i'm thankful for both of you brothers and the opportunity to uh speak about this i'm hoping that it will be a reoccurring thing i know that my church uh especially has been helped by a lot of the eschatology matters content yeah, um so same here. Being Excellent. able to do this and be part of this conversation, I think, is is great. And I'm hoping and praying uh, that what we're doing here helps more than just my church, um, that it helps our individual churches, but also local churches all over the place. And uh, my prayer is that over time, more and more will come to the post-millennial position, because I think it really does change the way that you live your life for Christ. It does. Right? Because suddenly, everything we do matters. Suddenly, uh, we're not just waiting for Jesus to come back. We're not just waiting to be beat down into the ground by our enemies, spiritual or physical. Instead, we're going on the offensive and we're saying, OK, Jesus promised the gates of hell won't prevail. They're on the defensive, not us. That's we're right. actually mo mobile. We are the the militia of God going forth and we're going forth not with uh, bazookas and physical weapons. We're going forth with the sword of the Lord, which is his word. And it's able to pierce through and cut down the worst enemies of Christ and make them into the most godly of saints. So praise the Lord. For Amen. That. Oh, that's a good word, man. Um, 
yeah no just thank you both we do want to do this uh semi regularly we want to at least do a few more of these and kind of um kind of tie this theme together but one of the things i've appreciated um about you guys and your ministries but also the the other guys that we have that contribute to eschatology matters um is a true desire to glorify christ and i don't just say that as a toss around you know flippant flippant a uh, little tagline or anything like that but we say eschatology matters um as tim says because it does um but we say eschatology matters because it's about christ's victory so we have disagreements on that we we want to be clear with those disagreements but we want to delve in this this pursuit precisely because it's describing the victory of Christ, and we want to honor Christ in all things. If this was ever just an an intellectual exercise or some some uh, some pursuit of vanity, uh, we need to throw it in the trash. But if we are trying as best as we can with our limited faculties to grapple with these stupendous truths from Scripture for the glory of Christ and to the honor of Christ, then um, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. So thank you guys for joining me. Amen. Truly grateful for this, and yeah, look forward to talking to you soon. Okay. Blessings. Thank you.